Those are powerful songs for us to remember, especially as we go into the new year. Ring it out. That's a great, that would be a great sermon to preach on too. Ring out. Share the gospel message. Something great for all of us to do as we enter into 2020. And that other song, Thank You. For all that you've done, I will thank you. And that, that has to be the heart that we have today. And as we move into a new year, a, a heart of thanksgiving and gratitude. And as Paul said in Colossians chapter 2, that we overflow with gratitude. And when we have that kind of heart, uh, God certainly will be pleased. Thank you for being here. It's been a great day. This is our last Sunday for 2019. I was talking to someone this morning, and they said it just felt like yesterday was January 1st, and that's how it often is at the end of each year. And so thank you for being here as we close out another year. This is a time where many of us take the time to reflect. Maybe some of you have been on vacation for a week or maybe even longer than that, where we think back to 2019. We think about a lot of different things in our lives. And I just want to say that I am thankful to be a part of this congregation here. I'm thankful to be a part of the West Main Church of Christ. We are blessed here. And it is good for us to to stop and to smell the roses, to appreciate what has taken place here in 2019. We, I'm thankful for the, the young people here, uh, that they have a, a zeal to know more about God. And I'm thankful for their parents who are striving to teach them the way of truth. For our elders and our deacons and all the Bible class teachers, thank you for all of those who have taught this year and spending that time serving in some shape or form for the members here that love one another, that encourage one another. I'm not just saying this when I get up here and I say, you know, I'm thankful for the West Main Church. I really do mean it. We are really blessed here. And we've had more souls saved here uh, in 2019. We have been ringing out the gospel message. And that's who we are supposed to be, to go and to make disciples and to teach people the good news of Jesus Christ. And I'm confident that as we look into 2020, that great things are on the way, even more great things for this congregation here. So thank you for your faith as we move into a new year. As we move into a new year, it is good to think about where we are individually and even collectively. And I want to consider this morning Revelation chapter 2. And Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, we find Jesus giving messages, giving words to uh, a number of churches in Asia Minor. And this study from Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 is a powerful study. It is a reminder of some things that Jesus expects from his people. And as we think about our Savior Jesus, as we think about his expectations for his people, I believe these two chapters here really help us to see what we should be all about, both collectively and individually as we enter into a new year. Now, I've heard individuals use this example before, and I've used it before, but I want to use it again, where I want you to imagine for a moment, as what we find here in Revelation chapter 2, as Jesus would begin writing to these, or speaking to these churches here, imagine for a moment if Jesus gave us a message, if he sent us some kind of, of, of letter in the mail. And he shared some things with us. What do you think he would want West Maine to know as we go into 2020? What, would he, what do you think he would want to share with us as a, as a body together and even individually some things that we need to remember as we move into the new year? Well, he's not going to do that, but we do have his word. We do have what he has told these churches here in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3 that give us a good indication of what we should be all about as his people, what we should be all about as we dive into or as we begin another year. And so I want to consider this message from Jesus from Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3. There are seven thoughts I want to share with you from Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3. And these seven thoughts, I think, are good for us to remember, to ponder, to reflect upon as we look back in 2019 and as we move into 2020 about who we are as the people of God and about the God that we serve, our Savior Jesus, who is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and the expectations he has for us here at the West Main Congregation. And so as you look at Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, if he did write a letter to us, what might he say? What might he want us to know as we move into another year? 
I want to share with you seven thoughts, and I want to begin by looking at Revelation chapter 2. Then Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know. He says, I know your deeds. What's interesting, when you look at all of the seven churches that are, that are mentioned here that Jesus is going to speak to, he says the same thing in each, in each, to each one. In verse 8, in the church in Smyrna, he said, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this, I know your tribulation. And verse 12, to the angel of the church in Pergamon write, the one who has a sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell. And verse 18, to the angel of the church in Thyatira, the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze says this, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. In chapter 3 and verse 1, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. And that's not good, but he does say, I know your deeds and what you have done. And verse 7, to the angel of the church of Philadelphia he would say the same thing in verse number 8, I know your deeds. All through this, to all of the churches, he begins the same way. He mentioned the things concerning what they were going through, the, the challenges that they were facing, the good things that they were doing, their faith, and, and the fact that they were experiencing so many things. And while he's not going to write us a letter, I do think it is important for us to know that as we think about 2020 and moving forward, that Jesus knows what's going on here at West Main. That he knows what's going on in our lives. I think about Luke chapter 12 and how Jesus spoke about how he knows the number uh, or the amount of hair that we have on our heads. He knows who we are. He knows our deeds and our faith, our sickness and our struggles. And he is the one that can truly say, I know. And I think about the members here in 2019 who have lost loved ones this year. It's hard to lose a loved one. It's never easy. And the members who are going through different treatments, medical treatments, maybe even right now, and sicknesses and struggles with their children and their faith and just so many different challenges, well, you need to know that Jesus knows. I think that's one of the most powerful things as you look at Revelation 2 and 3, that Jesus, he does know. And we cannot just kind of just kind of quickly go over this. You need to know you're not alone as you go into this new year. Now, you may feel alone in your house, but you're not alone as you go into the new year. Jesus is with you. And I love how he starts off in, in chapter 2, the one in verse number 1, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one, listen to this, who walks among the seven gold, golden lampstands. He was with his people. You see that? He was with his people, and he knew what was taking place in those churches. And so to the church at West Main, Jesus says, I know. What a powerful blessing that is for us to know that he knows all. And while it's good for us to know that Jesus knows everything, it is also good for us to, to consider this, the ramifications of that, that he really does know everything to the point that if he were to write us a letter, this is something that he might also say, but I have this against you. Because, because he did know everything that was taking place in these churches. He knew also the good and, and the bad. He knew the, the great things that they were doing and the areas where they needed to improve. Look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4. He, he spoke about, actually look back in verse 2. As he spoke to the church in Ephesus, he says, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. If you're moving to another town, that sounds like a great congregation to maybe place membership in. They're doing so many great things. But listen to what he says next. Because Jesus knows the hearts of men. He said, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. You see that? He knew everything, but he also had something against them. There was room for them to grow, and it was not to be taken lightly. In fact, when you look at verse number 12, as he wrote to the church in Pergamon, or spoke to the church there, he said in verse 13, I know where you dwell, 
where Satan's throne is, sounds like his influence there, and you hold fast my name, that's great, and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you, he knew about that brother in Christ who had died, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some in the same way. Hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. I know what's happening here, but I also have a few things against you. And I believe one of the most powerful lessons that we can learn as we look at these churches and what Jesus says to them is that the conduct among God's people and what we believe and what we do and what we hold unto, it really does matter in his eyes. It matters to him. It matters to Jesus about what we believe and what we do and what we practice. And yet the interesting thing is, not all the churches have this. The church in Philadelphia in verse 7, you don't see this phrase, but I, but I have this against you. In fact, in verse 7, He says to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? He who is holy, who is true as the key of David, who opens and no one will shut and who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. There it is there. He said, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door, which no one can shut because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie, and I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word. You have kept my word of my perseverance. I also will keep you from the hour of testing. I really like the sound of that. That hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. You see what he says there? There is, no, there is no, I have this against you. There's only positive things there. And I think that's really encouraging as well because if they could do God's will, we can do God's will as well. There is a standard for us to meet God and what he has to say in his word. And they were doing exactly that. So if Jesus were to write us a letter, do you think he might say to us, but I have this against you? Well, I don't know. I don't know if he would write that for us. But I do want you to think about this. What exactly could he potentially say if he did have that against us? As we think about our lives, our hearts, our attitudes, what might he want us to see or have against us? You go back to Ephesians, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 2. I'm thinking about Ephesians because the church in Ephesus is there. What did he have against them in verse 4? Do you see it? Remember it? You've left your first love. Could that be the case for some of us as we look back in 2019, in 2018, and 2017? Do we or have we left our first love? Yes, we may still be holding fast to the deeds and toil and perseverance and calling out people who are false in their teaching and, and have not even grown weary, but have we lost our first love? Might that be something that he has against some of us? I can't judge your hearts, but but Jesus can. He can judge, and he will judge mine as well. Or what about the church in Sardis in chapter 3 and verse 1? To the angel of the church in Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive. And that, that's pretty powerful too, isn't it? It appeared that people knew about that congregation. That was some, maybe even like a destination. They're doing great things at that church. And the contribution every week is really good, and their worship and the way that they conduct themselves, you know, you have a name for yourself. But read the rest of what he also says. At the end of verse 1, he says, but you are dead. So on the, appear- the outside, the appearance, it appeared everything was great. But Jesus knows the hearts of men. And it was very clear that he says, you are dead to the point that he says, wake up. They needed a wake up call. Do some of us need a wake-up call as we move into 2020? Could it be that he might have something against us like he did the church in Laodicea in verse 16 of chapter 3? Remember in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 16? Now he knew their deeds in verse 15, that they were neither cold nor hot. I wish, as Jesus says, that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. 
That's what he had against them. Might he have that against us? That's something that we need to be thinking about and really considering this idea of indifference. I did a sermon a few weeks ago called Stagnant in Spirit from the book of Zephaniah. Remember that? And, and we talked about the danger of us becoming indifferent and having a spirit of apathy. Maybe Jesus wouldn't say any of this to us. Maybe he would get the message like the church in Philadelphia. What do you think? What I do believe and know that it's always good for us to stop and to search and to search our souls and to consider our ways, as the prophet Haggai said. Consider your ways. That's a great way to reflect upon 2019. Consider your ways and the ways that you're going to take into 2020. And I say that because, because of something very important. Because Jesus makes it very clear to the churches then, and he wants to make it very clear to us today. He says, remember and repent. I want to just step away here real quickly and look over in Mark chapter 1. I did a sermon earlier this year from Mark chapter 1 about an unpopular message. That is with respect to the world when it comes to repentance. But Jesus, from the beginning spoke a message of repentance. In Mark chapter 1 and verse number uh, 14, it says, Now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. He would say that in Luke 13 and verse 3, 4, and 5. Except you repent, you will all likewise perish. The apostles said the same message. And now Jesus, he hasn't changed his message at all. As he speaks to these churches here in Asia, he reminds them all throughout chapter 2 and chapter 3. Look back at chapter 2 and verse number 5. He said, therefore, remember from where you have fallen. That shows the significance. They had lost their first love. He's just not trying to say, well, it's not too big of a deal. It's a really big deal. He said, you have fallen. Remember, in verse 5, where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. That's not the only place where he said it. He said it in verse 16 to the saints in Pergamum. Therefore, repent. He said it in chapter 3 to the church in Sardis. You know, the church that, was, that looked really great, but was actually dead on the inside. He said in verse, uh, verse 3, so remember what you have received and heard and keep it. Remember what you have received and heard and keep it. That sounds like Jude. Doesn't that sound like Jude? kept in Christ, and we need to keep ourselves in the love of Christ. Brothers and sisters, as we go into 2020, we need to remember, and if necessary, or when necessary, we will have to repent. The message of Jesus here is simple and clear. To the West Main Church of Christ, if you were to write us a letter, you think he'd say something like this? Remember and repent. He demands that. It's not optional in nature. Now, not all the saints had drifted away, but for many of those congregations, it was enough to where Jesus had to say something. He had to get their attention. He had to wake them up. He had to remind them that a little leaven can, can, can impact the, the entire lompa dough. A little leaven can go a long way in, in holding back the people of God. Not all the saints had been stained, though, back in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 24, as he spoke to the church in Thyatira, he said, But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, as he talked about the teaching of, of the woman named Jezebel earlier, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. So not everyone was going down a path where they had fallen or a path where they needed to repent. But well, make no mistake about it, this is what Jesus wants us to do. As we move into a new year in a few days, and by the way, let me just say this, you know the best way to start your new year? You want to know the best way to start a 2020? Be here for Bible class at 730, all right? We're having Bible class. That's one of the best ways to start 2020, studying the Word of God together as a family. And as we think about 2020, we need to be asking ourselves some questions. Have we become overworked and tired and apathetic and resentful maybe that we've lost something in our relationship with Jesus? Have we lost our first love? Are, are, do we really take what he says seriously? Remember and repent. This may sound scary and depressing, but it's actually something good. Jesus was warning his people 
Why? Because that's what you do when you love someone. You don't just let them go down this path of destruction. You got to wake them up. And you got to get them to see change must happen now. He had not given up on these churches, and that's what I see as well. And that's a powerful thought. He doesn't give up on his people. He does warn them, and there will be consequences. And there has to be this change. But one of the most powerful things is that it's possible for these individuals, it was possible for them to make the necessary changes. It's possible for us to do the same. He did not tell them to disband, to split. He told them to repent. That's the message of Jesus. It's not a popular message, but it's the right message. It's a message of truth. It's not an option. Now, do you really believe what Jesus says there? Do I really believe this? Remember and repent. If you don't believe what he says here, let me give you two more words. Or else. Because after he says you need to remember and repent, what he also does, he says, or else. And that's something scary when you really think about that. We need to let it sink deeply into our hearts. He said back in Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 5, Therefore remember where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else. I'm coming to you and I will remove your lampstand out of its place. There's going to be a change in this relationship unless you repent. And verse number 16 of the same chapter. Therefore repent or else I'm coming to you quickly and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. That sounds like judgment language there. Now this is a side of Jesus many may not even be comfortable with, but this is the real Jesus. Jesus is love and he is mercy and he is patient and he's kind and he's also just. He's holy. He's righteous. He's faithful. And he will not tolerate certain things. He has expectations for his people, great expectations. And he gives us everything we need so that we can do his will, know his will, and follow him. Do you think he might say that to us if he wrote us a letter? I know, but I have this against you. Remember and repent or else. What I think I learned from this or what I know I learned from this is, number one, we should always take the the words of Jesus seriously. We need to take his authority seriously. He means what he says. And the fact that he said, I will remove this from you, is is serious. That our relationship with him is something that we should not just kind of take lightly, but it's something we really need to value and understand. Eternity is on the other side. And these are warnings for us that we truly need to listen to him or else. Speaking about listening, that's something I think he would definitely want us to know. Because that's something that he talks about so much to these churches here. He keeps saying over and over again, to him who has an ear, let him hear. Over and over again at the end of chapter 2 and verse number 29. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You can just walk your way through and you'll see this reminder. I need for you to listen to me. I need for you to listen carefully to me. Do not just listen to these words And then be like a man who looks at himself in a mirror and then he totally forgets about what he looks like. I need for you to hear these words, to hide these words in your heart, and to do them. So these instructions that he gave his people were not just something that they could just kind of listen to and say, oh, no, that's pretty good. That's pretty scary. Well, we'll just keep doing whatever we want to do. No. That's what the Jews did in the days of Ezekiel. He's a great speaker. Love his voice. He's preaching the truth, but we ain't going to do it. Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear. You know the interesting thing about all this? At some point in time, they had been listening. They had, he had their attention. They were listening to him because they had obeyed the truth at some point in time. They were listening to him. That's why they were calling out false teachers and persevering and performing these good deeds but in the process of time it can happen to all of us where we have this dullness of hearing where we hear but we're not really hearing he who has an ear let him hear we need to be careful how we hear 
We need to be making sure that we listen carefully to God's Word. Our disposition to His Word, to the preaching of God's Word, to the teaching of God's Word, it really does matter. It matters to Him, and it must matter to us. And I think if He wrote a letter to us, that's something else that He would want us to know. He who has an ear, let him hear. And he would want us to know this as well. He who overcomes, while he had to reprimand them and discipline them and help them to see some changes, he also is going to encourage them along the way. He who overcomes is a theme that we find all throughout this book. This book that is, that is good for us to read even today. While we have to keep everything in context, it's a book that helps us to see that those in Christ are victorious. That we are overcomers in Jesus Christ. Jesus did not give up on his people. He had not given up on his people, and they were not to give up on him. They were going through a lot. The brother named Anipus in, in chapter 2 in the church in, uh, the church in Perg- or Smyrna, uh, he, he had lost his life. And yet, or I'm sorry, the church in Pergamon, this man had, had died. He was faithful, though. And, and the other saints needed to continue on with Christ. They were to overcome He kept saying this over and over again. He's encouraging them despite all the things that they're going through. So as you think about your 2019, what challenges have you had? What disappointments have you had? What storms, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, have you experienced? Maybe you're still in your storm. Jesus wants you to remain with him. In 2020, do not leave Jesus. Where else can you go if you do? In 2020, remember him. Remain with him. And be overcomers. Our strength is found only in him. And he didn't give up on us. So we cannot give up on him. Yes, these Christians were going through persecution to the point of them losing their lives. They could do it. We can do this as well. He who overcomes, do not give up. Do not give up because as we've been talking about in our Bible class, we're all standing on the edge of eternity. And what he reminds us in these two chapters here, he reminds us that he will give us something. That we have something to look forward to one day. And that's where our minds need to be. As as you go through all of this, go back to chapter 2 and verse 7. We can't look at every one, but he says, He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And verse 10, uh, be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Verse 17, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. Chapter 3 and verse 5, even to the brethren in Sardis. He said, he who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. Now I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. You see what Jesus is doing? He has this nice bookend. He starts off with this great confidence that they should have. I know. He ends by giving them even more confidence. I have something to give you. Do you want it? Will you remain with me so you can receive what I actually want to give to you? This awesome reward in heaven. Being in the presence of God and Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and and, and God's angels for eternity. Is that what you want? If that's what you want, then be one who overcomes, one who remembers and repents, one who listens, and not just listens when it's convenient, but we listen no matter what. We stand fast. Why? Because heaven is on the other side. and Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, has done everything for us so that we can be with him one day. From these letters, we see what Jesus wants from his people. We can know what he wants from, for us or from us as, as a congregation as we move into 2020. He wants trust. He wants obedience. He wants zeal. He wants sound doctrine. He wants us to labor and to have courage and to love 
and to serve and spiritual growth, which no doubt will also create numerical growth. He wants purity, repentance, no tolerance for false teaching, discipline to wayward members, and constant self-evaluation. We know how we can please him. And these seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 help us to see and to know what it is that Jesus, our King, wants from us. And so as we move into 2020, let's become more like him. Let's love as he loves. Let's be holy as he is holy. Let's worship him and let's remain with him. Let's be overcomers and let us eagerly await the return of our Savior. He appeared the first time. The grace of God appeared and brought to man salvation. One day, Jesus will appear again. He will return. We need to be ready for when that day comes. If you're not a Christian, what better way to start a new year, a new decade, by putting on Christ, by allowing that old man to die, by following him, becoming a disciple, a follower of Jesus. We want to help you to do that. We talk so much about the word of God because the word of God is real. It really is his word. And it gives you what you need to know and how to respond to God so that you can receive this grace that was given. And we want you to be saved. We want you to be in heaven one day. We don't want you to perish. We want you to be a part of the body of Christ. Do you need to do that? Is that where you are today? If you're in need of salvation, if you're in need of encouragement, come now as we stand and as we sing.